Kegeming, the social media manager here at Kegeming.com. And I'm pleased to welcome Shane and Hannah Burkhoff back to Kegeming.com to talk about advocating for an all age and ability friendly society. Welcome, you two. Hi, thank you for having us again. Thank you. Of course. And for this week's theme, we'll be focusing on creating an all age and ability friendly society. So I wanted to first start by saying, how do you feel that the U.S. is doing in terms of being accessible? Kind of following up on our how we got here interview and what changes can be made in your minds to help people living with disabilities live more freely and independently in their communities? That is a great question. Um, in terms of how I think that we are doing as a nation, as a society, I'd say we're moving in the right direction. We're certainly doing better than we were 50 years ago, um, but there's still a lot of progress to be made until people with disabilities can exist freely and without judgment and with all the same rights and privileges that non-disabled people have as well. Great to hear. Um, are there any other comments that you have, like specific changes that we need to make? Yeah, I think, know. yeah. yeah. I think one thing that Shane and I feel really passionately about is air travel and how hard it is currently to travel, um, you know, on airplanes with wheelchairs. So I think that's a huge, you know, spot for improvement would be improving the way that people with disabilities can access air travel. I mean, there's tons of other <laughs> issues as well. That's just one of the ones that we care about a lot. I would say an overarching one is to just be mindful of how we think about disability. Mm -hmm. A lot of the lack of access, the root cause of it is because of old, outdated understandings of disability. So being you know, aware and mindful of the fact that people with disabilities are out here thriving, living awesome, amazing lives, just like everyone else is really important. And we should not be looked at with pity or negativity or anything like that. Absolutely. When I heard about a statistic, it was like the quality of life of people who are living with disabilities live and feel that they're happier than those who don't, which I thought, you know, it's really telling to who they are as people and who you are. Um, I think it's really empowering and I think we should embrace those abilities um, no matter how big and small. And that kind of leads me to my next question, which is, as you both continue to, you know, imagine your life as you continue to age, um, do you feel like you're comfortable with the resources and support that you have now, or are there changes that need to be made in between now and then? Something that I think we're lucky to have already is an accessible house. Because Shane uses a wheelchair, we've made things accessible. So as we age, we don't have to make as many changes as we would if we hadn't started yet. So that's something that we're, you know, we're lucky to have is a, a house that we can age in. Absolutely. And I think another big area where maybe we're not set up very well is in the area of caregivers. So right now, Hannah is my primary caregiver. Um, but down the road, when we have children or as we get older, there may come a time when we need to bring in more caregivers. And the system uh, that is in place right now is horrible, uh, for lack of a better word, um, in terms of funding caregivers, getting reliable caregivers, um, the systematic oppression of disabled people makes it so that we can't really have money um, or very much money. Um, and if you do, you can't have caregivers. And if you do, <laughs> you have to pay for caregivers out of your own pocket, which can very quickly become very expensive. So that's an area of our future that is very uncertain. We're not sure you know, how we might go about financing caregivers if and when we need them. Sure. Really great answer. I think it's so hard for people to find caregivers and there's a caregiver shortage going on right now. And I think that really speaks to, you know, the issue at hand. Like if you, Hannah, needed to, you know, work more or you had to, you know, tend to your own personal emergency or something like that and, you know, you wouldn't know what to do in terms of taking care of Shane. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And and talk about like an emergency situation, but the, the process of getting a, a hired caregiver is a long one. And so being able to like get one immediately if we needed one, I have no idea what we would do. So. Yeah, I mean, we're lucky to have friends and family that yeah. those are our, you know, emergency backups. But uh -huh. in terms of like a, a 
governmental or like societal right. safety net, it's it's not really there. Yeah, it's very uncertain. And um, that kind of leads into our next question about language. Language is a really powerful tool that has the ability to humanize and dehumanize people. How do you think that we can work to reduce ableism and disparaging language used to describe people living with disabilities? That's a great point. And I think a major thing that we can do is talk about disability in more positive terms. So often I hear people saying to me things that show that they clearly think of my life in very negative ways, that they pity me, they think my life is miserable and sad and lonely. And so I think remembering that people with disabilities are not living these sad, lonely, horrible lives is really important in making sure that our language reflects that. Yeah, and people will say to Shane things like, I don't see you as disabled. And, you know, Shane always says to them, I am disabled and that's not a bad thing. You know, the word disabled isn't a bad thing. So just remembering that it's not a negative term and disabled people's lives aren't negative is really important. Absolutely. It's such a great answer. Um, and in transitioning over to music, I feel like music has the power to heal. And how do you feel that it can help others who are experiencing disabilities as they are living? And are there any go-to songs or playlists that you have that help you through that? I think that music has always been a, a way for me to relax and escape maybe the stresses of life. We do a lot of um, work in our daily life. And at the end of the day, if I'm feeling fatigued or tired, whether or not that's related to my disability doesn't matter, but I love to put on some jazz music and just unwind and relax and not think about the world or any of the stress in our life for a little while. So that's the way that music has been beneficial for me. Yeah, I mean, we also listen to it a lot on road trips. I think that's like one of our favorite things is when we're doing a road trip, we'll make a playlist ahead of time. And we have differing music choices. So Shane will put in some like heavy, loud music and I'll put on some like soft, quiet music. Yeah. You know, and then you'll add in like a jazz song. Oh yeah, from jazz to screamo mm -hmm. to back to jazz. Yeah. yeah. So we have some, some battles over it, but it's, it's fun. And I did something that's really neat is the project that Hannah and I were lucky enough to do at Genentech, yeah. where we worked with a variety of other advocates in the SMA community to conceive of and create a real song about our experiences living with a disability. Yeah. And uh, that's been a very rewarding project. And the song is amazing, so um, you should check it out. Uh, it's called Spaces by James Ian, who also lives with SMA. So, Phenomenal song, and we were very happy to be involved. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. I will definitely make sure to link to the music video and um, encourage all of our listeners and people watching to view the video as well. It's really Thank amazing. You. Yeah. Thank you to you two so much for joining us today. Thank you. Yes, it was a pleasure. Thank you.